Hello, everybody. My name is Graham Elwood, and you are watching The Political Vigilante. Look at that graphic pop-up. Man, I love robots. So I'm sure today you heard Hillary Clinton, A, say Bernie's not likable, and B, say she's not going to vote for him. She won't endorse him. So she's basically, Hillary Clinton is saying, I'm going to help Trump get reelected, is what she's saying. So first she said this ridiculous thing. Um, Hillary Clinton said a new documentary that nobody likes Bernie Sanders. Polling shows Sanders the most popular senator in the country. Nobody likes him. That's why he's broken records for individual donations. She is such a sociopath, she can't handle the fact, A, there's a bunch of other women running for president, a thing she actively blocked in 2008 and in 2016. That wasn't a coincidence that no other women ran against her in 2016 because it was her year. Bernie asked Liz Warren to run against her and Liz wouldn't, right? So that's, that's, that's what this Hillary thing is. There's so, uh, and also this, Sanders is in the national polls. And then another poll just came out showing everybody head to head against Trump, all these people losing head to head against Trump, and they just happened to forget to put Bernie in there. <laughs> like, he's leading in Iowa, he's leading in New Hampshire, he's leading in national polls, he's leading in head to head polls, right? And Hillary's talking about he's not likable. He's not likable. Just flat out said it. Well, you know what else she said? This is in 2008 when she was running for president the first time. My question to you is simply this. What can you say to the voters of New Hampshire on this stage tonight who see your resume and like it, but are hesitating on the likability issue where they seem to like Barack Obama more? Well, that hurts my feelings. <laughs> I'm sorry, Senator. I'm sorry. <laughs> Isn't she trying to be so personal? It hurts her feelings because she's human. She's not this cold, mean person. That's what that response was about. They, the Democratic Party in 2008 realized she's not that likable. The Clintons were not that likable. But I'll try to go on. <laughs> <laughs> He's very likable. I, I, I agree with that. I don't think I'm that bad. Um, uh, you're likable you know, enough. Thank Hillary, you so no much. <laughs> Clinton, who called her corrupt in the 2008 primary. I'm sorry. Obama called Clinton corrupt in the 2008 primary. He called her very corrupt in the 2008 primary. Right? And when she lost, she endorsed him and did 10 events supporting him. Bernie called her corrupt in the 2016 primary and endorsed her and did over 30 events stumping for her. And yet the blue check psychopaths on Twitter still think Bernie, oh, he hurt her somehow. A higher percentage of Hillary supporters voted for John McCain and Sarah Palin than the number of uh, one in four Hillary supporters bailed on Obama and voted for John McCain. One in eight Bernie supporters voted for Trump instead of Hillary. So that's all nuts, that's all insane. But we're gonna get into how really corrupt Hillary Clinton is. And we're gonna talk about what Julian Assange said about her. But before we do that, um, well, first let me, let's, let's show this interview from Julian Assange about Hillary Clinton from from, I think this is like 2012. There's a early 2014 email from Hillary Clinton. Sorry. So not so long after she left. Second. So this is from like 2015, 2016, during the, the, the last presidential election. Of state to her campaign manager, John Podesta. Mm -hmm. uh, that email, it states uh, that ISIL, ISIS, is uh, funded by Saudi Arabia and Qatar, mm. the governments of Saudi Arabia and Qatar. Now, th this is a, I actually, I think this is the most significant email in the whole collection. Mm. Uh, and perhaps because 
Saudi and Qatari money is spread um, all over the place, inclu including into many media institutions. All serious analysts know, uh, even the US government uh, has mentioned or, or agreed with that some Saudi figures have been supporting ISIS, funding ISIS. But the dodge has always been that's uh, what well, it's just some rogue princes mm. using their cut of the oil money to mm. do whatever they like, but actually the government disapproves. But that email says that no, it is the governments of Saudi and the government uh, mm. and Qatar uh, that have been funding ISIS. The Saudis, the Qataris, the Moroccans, the Bahrainis, particularly the Saudis and the Qataris, are giving all this money to the Clinton Foundation uh, while Hillary Clinton is Secretary of, of State and the State Department is approving massive arms sales, particularly to Saudi Arabia. Yeah. Un un under Hillary Clinton, uh, and our Clinton emails uh, reveal uh, a significant discussion about it, um, the largest ever arms deal in the world was made with Saudi Arabia, more than $80 billion. Mm. In, in fact, during her tenure as Secretary of State, total arms uh, exports from the United States in, in terms of the dollar value doubled. And of course, the consequence of that is that this notorious terrorist jihadist group called ISIL or ISIS uh, is created largely with money from the very people who are giving money to the Clinton Foundation. Yes. <laughs> you get a lot of complaints um, from people saying, what is WikiLeaks doing? Are they trying to put Trump in the White House? My analysis is that Trump would not be permitted to win. Uh, why do I say that? Because He's had every establishment offside. Trump doesn't have one establishment, maybe with the exception of the evangelicals, if you can call them an establishment. But uh, banks, in, intelligence, uh, arms companies, well, they all want him. Beat foreign money, etc. Yeah, is all united uh, beh behind Hillary, Hillary Clinton, mm. and uh, and the media as well. Mm. Uh, so media owners, uh, and even journalists themselves. Well, I thought that was Russia that did everything. <laughs> this is showing. And had Trump actually been an outsider, they would have either impeached him in his first six months on the emollients clause, or he would have tripped and fell, or they would have, there's no way, right? There's no way. It wasn't Russia. So, so listen to all this. But I want to bring in somebody uh, we've had on the show before, Taylor Hudak from Action for Assange. Taylor, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, so you obviously saw what Hillary said today, and uh, you saw that what, what Julian said from about uh, three, four years ago. What is your take on this thus far? Yeah, so um, I believe that Hillary Clinton is definitely losing her relevancy. However, I'm not so sure that she is losing her power. I feel that she did say this statement with the belief that she perhaps had an opportunity to take votes away from Bernie. Um, similar to you and many other people, I do believe that she has um, sociopathic uh, qualities and behaviors and is very narcissistic of a person to actually believe that her word at this point will still stick with many voters. Unfortunately, um, I think some people do still kind of elevate her and raise her up as um, a good person and a good politician and somebody who would have been a, a great president. Um, unfortunately, I believe there are some people who still feel that way. But again, this is just a sort of narcissism on her part. I don't know what's worse for her, for her to see a woman become president or to see Bernie Sanders defeat Trump. 
Well, that's the real, that's the thing we're getting. I mean, I, I think this is another, while this was kind of frustrating to hear initially, I think it's going to backfire like when she called Tulsi Gabbard. She saw Tulsi start to get a lot of traction over the summer. Tulsi was the most Googled name after she took out uh, several people, including Kamala Harris at numerous debates. People were starting to, wow, who's this Tulsi Gabbard? And then she called Tulsi Gabbard a Russian asset and Tulsi called her the queen of warmongers, which Hillary, Hillary's arrogance, her narcissistic, um, sociopathic arrogance gave Tulsi Gabbard like almost two weeks of free ad time getting all these interviews. And, and good for Tulsi, she didn't back down or play politics. She just said she's the queen of warmongers and I'm tired of this nonsense. And again, I think this is starting to backfire a little bit because here's a tweet from Tom Steyer said, the risk of getting in the middle of it, I like Sanders, now let's move on America. Andrew Yang said it's 2020, not 2016, right? Which is, which is like impressive. And then here is Margaret Kimberly, who's like one of the editors at the Black Agenda Report. Hillary Clinton will be poisoned until the day she dies, right? So this is, <laughs> this is a, 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 a woman of, of color saying this. But, but Taylor, I want to bring up, um, before we get into all the other just systemic corruption of her, um, she can't handle the fact that this is who is endorsed. Jayapal, like, look at this. Nina Turner, Dr. Victoria Dooley, who I've interviewed on this show, Ocasio-Cortez, uh, Amy Valela, who I've talked to, I've met, she came to Ron and I show twice, Omar, these are all, <laughs> all women of color that have endorsed Bernie Sanders. And they keep trying this He's not light. He's, they, they tried the sexist thing a week ago with Liz Warren. They tried that. But here's the thing that people are waking up to. Bernie can beat Trump. The, the pie in the sky thing that she said about, you know, she called single payer health care and free college tuition. She called them ponies in 2016. And I think she can't handle the fact that Bernie is this popular without every politician would tell you I don't know how you're going to win unless you get corporate money. Like they just, they would write you, oh, you're just some Green Party candidate. Maybe you could win city council in some little hippie town, but you'll never be a real legitimate candidate. Bernie Sanders is, is the most popular candidate out there. He's ahead in the polls. He has the most individual donors and he could be president of the United States. If he defeats Trump, it says bye-bye Hillary, bye-bye identity politics, bye-bye never admitting you're wrong and blaming Jill Stein in Russia for everything, she can't handle it. Yeah, no, you're exactly right. I don't think she could handle this because that would indicate that perhaps Sanders could have beat Trump in 2016. And that would be extremely embarrassing uh, for her. And I think this also uh, kind of comes out at a convenient time uh, to kind of put some validity perhaps behind what Warren has said in her uh, statements, which I was really, of course I was irritated that she even brought that up because why bring it up now at, you know, right before a debate and then we waste 10 minutes talking about that during the debate instead of how these candidates are gonna make American lives better. Then we have, have to waste uh, a week, a week and a half talking about this issue. And we completely forgot about the uh, fight for no war with Iran and who knows what they've done um, behind the public eye. That's such a great point. And, and if anybody knows how to manipulate the public while they're doing backdoor deals with war, it's the Clintons. I mean, as we just said, you know, it's not just the Julian Assange thing in the WikiLeaks. It was in the New York Times that 20 countries that donated to the Clinton Foundation all got defense contracts when she became Secretary of State. That was, that's, a, that's just a matter of public record. And so she's, she's been against Iran. There's, there's, there's video of her as a senator in 2007 calling Iran evil. And she would have been firm with Iran. It's, it's why Julian Assange brings up that point. It's why, look, the defense contractors, the the, bait, the the gateway or the uh, beltway insiders, they all were happy because they knew the war the war game would keep going strong. And you know, Trump ran on an anti-interventionist campaign. He's not being held to his word at all. And that's the other thing. They can't if if the Democratic establishment 
really wanted to beat Trump, they would do like what Bernie's trying to do. You call out his $1.5 trillion tax break. You call out his leaving troops in Syria, as he said, to guard the oil. You call out his allegiance with Saudi Arabia. I mean, you call all that stuff up, but they can't. They just say Trump bad, liar, impeachment, Trump, Trump, Russia, Trump, Trump bad. Because if they actually called out his corruption, they're calling out their own. I mean, it's why Trumpers think, oh, Trump's going after the Epstein people. No, he's doing that because he has ties to Epstein and Prince Andrew. And so he's got to make it seem like he's going after, just like the Clintons have all these ties to Russia. Uh, Bill Clinton got paid $500,000 to give a speech for a Russian company that is backed by the Kremlin. Uh, the Uranium One deal, which they then tried to debunk, but actually the debunk was a lie. It's true. They got uranium. <laughs> they, a uranium company donated the, well, donated to the Clinton Foundation. So they're all, they're all filthy corrupt, and Bernie is winning without any corruption. And I want to show you this, too, because you're talking about... And that's the one thing about Bernie. You're right. You know, people, even if you're somebody that does, and I believe that your viewers do agree with his policies, but say for somebody who is uh, it, more on the right of the political spectrum, even if you don't agree with Bernie Sanders politically, he is honest. He is a person of integrity. He is, he doesn't lie about things. He has a track record of holding the same positions for years and years and working really hard to implement these policies that he has stood for for a very long time. And it's Liz Warren and people like Hillary Clinton who are opportunists and who are liars and manipulators, not Bernie Sanders. So um, it really is insane when I see people on the mainstream media, particularly the women of The View, who thought that Warren won won this debate with Sanders, or won this sort of a conflict with Sanders. It's amazing. It's a little bit off topic, but I just wanted to get that out there, that he is the one with the history of being honest. Well, no, it's not off topic, because what you're showing is the view is what I call the diversity of the ruling class. Uh, on the, the optics of it look like, oh, what a diverse, you know, we've got Meghan McCain, who is a conservative, and you know, Whoopi's a black woman and all these different types of people. That's a, that's a scam. That is a panel of millionaires. They're all millionaires who get their seven and eight figure, you know, paychecks from the ruling class, from the multi, from the six, one of the six companies that owns 95% of all media, that that shapes the narrative. So that's why those rich women all say, wow, Warren won. And, and you know, McCain will go, I don't agree with her policy, but she won. That's, that's contrived. That's contrived to move. Even the conservative thinks she won. No, 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 no. All the millionaires think she won. That's what that is. And that's why they can't handle that because this, this, this worked in 2016. But you know what the view can't handle and what they won't talk about? This. All of these, Whippy Goldberg's not talking about this. She's not talking about that. But I want to show you this, this other thing. Not everyone's waking up to this fact. This is Tucker Carlson. Not, <laughs> there's so much I don't agree with Tucker Carlson. He says things about immigration and ra that, I, that I don't agree with, and some of it I find flat out offensive. But he's the one guy who's been kind of right about Syria, which is crazy to me. And this is what he said recently. A year from today, we'll be hosting this show from the National Mall as the next president of the United States takes the oath of office. Will that president be Donald Trump? Well, as of tonight, Republicans in Washington feel confident that it will be. The official economic numbers are strong. The Democratic primaries are a freak show. Elderly socialists accusing each other of thought crimes. Republicans are starting to think that... Hold on. I, elderly socialists... Com <laughs> accusing each other of thought crimes? God, I gotta love Fox News. Always on point. Watch out. There's there's socialists, there's there's socialists uh, coming to the Denny's on Seniors Night. Anyway, victory is assured, and that's a mistake. America remains as divided as it was three years ago. So no matter what happens, nobody is going to win this election in a national landslide. Those don't happen anymore. Trump could lose. Will he lose? Well, that depends entirely on what he runs on. In 2016, Donald Trump defeated more than a dozen Republicans and then Hillary Clinton, 
by running as an insurgent, a man from outside the system, flipping the bird to the elites within. Virtually everything Trump said reinforced that message. The people who run this country are clueless. They have no idea what they're doing. They don't care about you. They've hollowed out our economy, crushed the middle class. They've screwed up our foreign policy. They left the door open on our southern border. They're children playing at leadership, and they've gotten rich doing it. The result is a national catastrophe. Now, Trump's campaign summed up that message in a single phrase, make America great again. In other words, let's not lie to ourselves. This is a disaster. The good news is we can fix it. Now, the people in charge hated to hear that, of course, because it implicated them. But voters responded. They knew it was true. And by the way, it's still true today. Things are a lot better in a lot of ways, but they're not fixed. Consider the state of the economy. The big numbers, unemployment and inflation, to name two, tell one story, and it's a good story. But dig a little deeper. A Pew poll from this fall provides a glimpse of what is actually happening in a lot of parts of the country. In that survey, 56 percent of Americans said the economy was excellent or good, and that's good news. But then there was this. Only 31 percent said the economy was helping them and their families. Just 32 percent thought the current economy was helping the middle class. 58 percent thought the opposite. Among lower-income Republicans, 47 percent said economic conditions were hurting them. Just 30 percent said they were helping. Now, keep in mind, these aren't sociology professors from the Oberlin faculty lounge. This is the president's core. It's his base. Why do they feel that way? It's not personal. It's just really simple. For a lot of middle-class people, wages are not keeping pace with expenses. Child care, housing, education, health care, they're all getting more expensive by the year. The student loan bubble is still inflating. It's burdening young people with debts so large they can't start families. Now, these are economic problems, but they require a political solution. Okay. So, what Tucker Carlson just said is a bunch of Bernie Sanders policies and platforms. He talked about Bernie, people don't, are making enough money. I mean, that's, a, and he said it. This isn't some poll of, of you know, people going to co-ops in uh, Oregon and, you know, and California. This is the president's base. And they, that's the thing. The media tells you, oh, the economy's good. So people, when they're asked that general question, say, oh, the economy's good. Why do they say that? Because they're hearing that all over the place. Because, and this is a myth. Oh, the stock market's doing well. The Dow's doing well. The stock market, 85% of all stocks are owned by 1% of the population, of course. But day-to-day -day life is not getting better. Bernie, and everyone is beginning to know this, Medicare for all, student debt forgiveness, $15 an hour, and, and good-paying union jobs with a Green New Deal, that actually helps the majority of Americans, and there's a bunch of people that might come over to him. Which, so let me ask you this. I, I, and I, I, I think one of the reasons why Hillary, well, she's doing two, two she's got a, a thing. She's trying to, she was trying to sell a book last month with her daughter, so she comes out and says ridiculous crap. Um, but she said, I won't, I won't endorse and they said, well, you endorse Bernie if he gets the nomination against Trump. She's like, well, I don't know. Let's see. So I thought it was any, I thought we got to be Trump. 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 But now she's saying she won't. She wants to help Trump win because let's, it, Bernie's policies hurt the ruling class. Trump and the Clintons are part of the ruling class. Fox News and MSNBC, their owners are part of the ruling class. Their millionaire mouthpiece journalists are part of the ruling class. So do you think this is one of the re what, like why do you think she's saying this now because she they all see that that bernie could win or what do you think yeah yes um and, and we've spoken about this before too i think they're starting to warm up to the idea that he could win the nomination um perhaps if he does they want to move him a little bit further to the right again i think she is somebody who's incredibly narcissistic um that believes that her word can really influence people i think it's a uh, personal for her and then also um, also for her own gain, as in like she does not want him to win the presidency because his policies are not conducive to her lifestyle. Um, she's not gonna be like impacted in a negative way, but his policies are not gonna be um, favorites among those of the ruling elite in the 1%. And then also too, I think that it would hurt her emotionally um, to see him beat Trump. I think she would hate to see that happen, just as I believe she would hate to see 
um, a woman beat President Trump. I think she would rather see uh, Trump win this election again uh, than another woman or Sanders, to be honest. And she even said several months ago that she would support whoever the nominee is because she believes she knows who that person is. Nobody is really sure who she was referring to. Um, I, I don't know why she would say that. I think that was more sort of like a mind game on her part. But I think those are the two factors that kind of encourage her to say that. Well, let's also not forget the Clinton Foundation uh, weapons deal tie that we just learned about. So if the, if the Clintons have no more power or influence, there's no reason for a country to donate to their foundation because you need a Clinton. A Clinton needs to be somewhere in power to, to push that. So it's like, why would Saudi or any of those countries donate to the Clinton Foundation if they're not going to get a weapons deal? And, and Hillary needs to be somewhere in power for that, or Bill or Chelsea. Some, one of the three of them needs to be in a high level of power somewhere. Bill can't because he was already president. So, I mean, she's, she's like, I better, I better get something. I better be Joe Biden's VP or something. And so I, I have to go after. I, I think, yeah, no, I agree with you. And I also think, too, that um, I, I wouldn't be surprised if in years to come we see Chelsea Clinton seeking office. Yeah, of course. Well, I want to talk about that because then, then, so then all this backlash came out on Twitter today and all these people, and it was good to see like a lot of the Bernie, all the Bernie supporters, but like, uh, you know, like I said, women of color, all these people, I mean, Bernie kind of made a veiled apology and then let it go, which I wish he wouldn't have done that. You know, he said, oh, I'm sorry if I called her corrupt back then or something. It was just like, Bernie, I wish he'd fight harder, but we all want him to take the gloves off, but that's, he's never really done that that hard. So I don't know. I, I, I don't, I don't. It's not a reason to bail on him, but it is a reason to be frustrated. But she took, a, so she, she tweeted out, I thought everyone wanted my authentic, unvarnished views. Oh, shut up. But to be serious, the number one priority for our country and world is retiring Trump. And as I always have, I will do whatever I can to support our nominee. Oh, God. She just. There is nothing authentic about her. That's what's so funny. When you read that, it made me laugh because there is nothing authentic about her. I... And no, I don't think that she. Um, I honestly think she would, like I said, would rather see Trump win a second term than have a woman or Sanders win. Yeah, because at least if Trump wins a second term, she'll go, then she can go, I told you, you should have, you know, I could have beat him, but, yeah. and you've got yes, behind Sanders, point. who everyone hates, you know, that'll, that'll justify that. So I just happened right. to respond to Hillary's, uh, this is what I uh, <laughs> asked her on Twitter. I said, can you authentically tell us why you flew on Epstein's plane two times, Bill 26 times, stayed at his compound in New Mexico, and had Jeline Maxwell attend your daughter's wedding two years after she settled out of court for being a pedophile sex trafficker? That was my question, because here's a photo. There's Jeline Maxwell. There's Bill Clinton, who was on Epstein's plane 26 times. There's Chelsea Clinton, who called the Palestinian girl, uh, told her, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry you feel that way. Um, yeah, there she is. Did she not know? This was two years after Virginia Roberts, I, I, I gotta make this very clear. Virginia Roberts said in a sworn deposition, not in an interview, not on social media, in a sworn deposition. So if you lie in a sworn deposition, you can be charged with perjury and do jail time. And they make that very clear when you do a sworn deposition in a court case. Virginia Roberts said that, that um, Jalene Maxwell raped and trafficked her and another woman made the claim as well. Jalene Maxwell settled out of court, which I don't know about you. If I was accused of something I didn't do, I wouldn't settle out of court, especially if I was rich. I'd be like, uh-uh, I'm clearing my name. We're going to trial. You settle out of court when you're busted. So you're trying to tell me Hillary Clinton didn't know who this woman, didn't know her history with Jeffrey Epstein, and the times they stayed at Epstein's compound, I've done videos on this, they stated his... Bill and Hillary stated his New Mexico compound. Did she not know what Jeffrey and Bill were doing the 26 times Bill was on his plane? Did she really not know? Is she just some, she doesn't know what's going on? Oh wait, that's what she claimed about Harvey Weinstein. How could I have known? She just doesn't know who she's standing next to. She's, so what is she, she's this strong woman with this history of being tough or is she just like this dingy housewife who's like, I don't know. I don't know I'm standing next to a murderer. There's the Prince of South. I didn't know that Henry Kissinger uh, helped Nixon lie about illegally bombing C Cambodia. I didn't know. I, I just, I don't know what I'm doing. 
I'm just so sick of the Clinton hypocrisy bullshit. Like, I'm so tired of it. Um, yeah. Um, no, and I, I give you credit, uh, before I comment on that, I give you credit for keeping that Epstein story um, alive and well, because you have not let it go when it's been very easy to probably do so. Um, because of course he's dead now, there's not going to be uh, a trial. Of course, the majority of people believe that he did not um, kill himself, but I give you credit for keeping that story alive and more people should follow, follow your lead and, and keep, keep talking about these issues. But again, you know, Hillary Clinton claims to be this feminist that's all for uh, women and girls, but she is uh, socializing with these people with horrible track records horrible track records. And um, it just goes to show that there is a completely different set of standards for powerful, uh, rich people and those who are um, an average American like us. Well, that's why I bring up the Epstein thing is because why I won't let the Epstein thing go is it's tied to all of these ruling class elites. So any, any issue and because Hillary refuses to go away, she could never admit she's wrong. She could never go, I ran a shitty campaign. Because let me tell you something, it wasn't Burn Bros or Jill Stein or Putin that prevented her from campaigning in Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania. She didn't campaign there. In the Podesta emails, among all the other corruption, like Donna Brazil giving her questions ahead of a debate and then CNN firing Donna Brazil, who now currently works at Fox yeah, News. Yeah, she works at Fox News. They hired her. Yeah, they hired her for Fox News. Her career should be over. Over. It should be over. over. But that's the ruling class. Don't worry. You'll, you'll get a little slap on the wrist, but we'll take care of you. Debbie Wasserman Schultz fired as the head of the DNC for corruption. Hillary hired her. That's the arrogance of the ruling class saying, we got you, and telling everybody down the line, don't worry, you stick with us, we'll protect you. That's what Epstein is all about. William Barr is, he's this guy that has all these ties to Epstein. He's Trump's guy and he can't, he, they've started to probe Jalene Maxwell. No, she should be in a goddamn orange jumpsuit. That shows you, I wanna show how corrupt the, the Clintons and the Trumps are all friends. They're all friends. They're all corrupt. So this tactic, and again, the fact that she has bamboozled American women into thinking she's some feminist hero, it's like, believe all women, except the women that accuse Bill Clinton. Those women we don't believe. Believe all women, except what? Virginia Roberts, who accused your friend that you invited to your daughter's wedding? Jalene Maxwell, who is a fucking pimp and a rapist and a pedophile? Like, who was... Tr who were the, the women that were trafficking the, the children? It was all it was all a bunch of women on top of Epstein. They were getting it's just insid it's insidious. It's insidious. You went to yeah. Jeffrey Epstein's compound. I, I, I'm, it's I just, to know women's roles in in these issues and the sex trafficking. Again, I'm not an expert on that topic. You have spoken about it before. I do know that women are often involved in this because people are less suspicious of a woman approaching them than of some weird man. So it's important to remember that women are just, um, well, maybe not just as involved, but to say that they are not involved in the sex trafficking is completely false. So there's a statistic out, uh, 40, about 44% of sex traffickers are women for the okay. very reason that you're talking about, because they use them to recruit. So about half, almost half. Almost yeah. half. They use them to recruit for that very reason. As we found with Epstein, like Victoria's Secret, Les Wexner, another good friend of Epstein, Victoria's Secret and these, some of these modeling agencies, one of them Donald Trump's modeling agency, were used, they're fake. They're, they're, they're used, they go to some uh, attractive young 14-year-old girl, a child, and say, Do you, we'll make you famous. You wanna be a big fancy model and walk the runways and work in Paris and wear $10,000 dresses? That's, and they use women to recruit them. And these are probably girls who come from maybe not the best home situation. So they hear that and they find some promise in that and they, they go with it. They probably prey on very vulnerable people and that's the, the tragedy in it all. And I always said that um, it is really unfortunate that the victims in this Epstein case are never gonna see him uh, be brought to justice. And we could only hope that um, something can be made of this. Something can uh, be done about this. And um, there was a reporter, of course, who knew about this, who chose not to speak out about it. And I don't know, I, you know, she could claim that she was afraid to do so. I don't remember her name, 
but that's not good enough for me because, you know, there are outlets like uh, WikiLeaks, for example. Now, I don't know if that material would be able to be transmitted to WikiLeaks, but that's why we have that organization. Um, but I feel that think of all the people that could have been saved because of this. Oh. And so that's why I just really credit you for, for talking about this. It's awful. You think about, he was arrested in 2009 and, and he was still trafficking girls while he was in jail. And that was William Acosta who set that sweetheart deal up. And William Acosta was told he's a CIA asset, back off, you know? And the Clintons knew about this. They participated in this. The Trumps knew about this and participated in this. How many victims could have been saved from this? How many victims are still out there because of these? So the Clintons have no moral anything to stand on. She's such a feminist hero. How many women of color did she help bomb and murder as Secretary of State when, when uh, Obama dropped more bombs than Bush? Like the, Hillary Clinton just is, is so... Ah. But there, here's some other responses that I think are worth noting. Aaron Matei, I think it's great that Bernie is ignoring Hillary's attacks. He, Bernie, they asked, why, why do you think Hillary keeps bringing up 2016? He goes, I don't know, you should ask her. And he said something like, well, my, on a good day, my wife likes me. He just says these, uh, you know, and I don't know, we'd like to see him take his gloves off more, but that's resonating with a fair amount of the, of the electorate, that Bernie is just like, ah, I'm better than this. So... She's a bitter troll trying to bait him right uh, as the primary starts. Her spiteful narcissism is obviously anyone with their eyes open. Why enable it? Which is great. And I think Aaron Matei is actually correct in this stance. And I want to I bring up um, one more uh, thing. Well, first of all, I just want to show this. Nobody likes Bernie. Oh, him, here's him announcing in Brooklyn. This is just, a, there's Bernie right there. You can barely see him. This is just, I've seen him speak twice. It's always packed with thousands of people. Hillary's trying to sell a book with her, with her sellout daughter. But I want to show you, yeah. you this. It's just completely false what she said. It, okay. Everything, yeah. Morning, <laughs> noon, and night. That's all she knows how to yeah. do is be false. But this is my favorite. This is from Tulsi Gabbard, who I know you're a supporter of because she stands for Julian Assange. But here's what Tulsi Gabbard said today in New Hampshire. <laughs> this is why Tulsi's great. Look, it's time to grow up. You know, this isn't high school. Uh, we're talking about real challenges that our country needs to address and the need for real leadership to focus on them, not on what's going on in Washington and the schoolyard clicks or whatever else it may be. There are real issues that people are struggling with and they're wondering why are our leaders not working for us? This is why I'm running for president, to change that, because Washington is so disconnected from the reality of, of what people are dealing with every day. There, there are people dying because of this opioid epidemic every day. This is what our leaders should be focusing on, among many other issues. Look, it's time to grow up. You know, this isn't high school. Uh, I just wanted to play that again. Yeah, it's not high school, and that's who Hillary Clinton sounds like. She sounds like the girl that lost the home coming queen thing because people don't like her and she couldn't accept it. She's just like, I want a pony, I want to be president, I'm going to be this, I'm going to be, I'm going to number the first one, and you, 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 you. You're like, she just sounds insane. And while well, that sounds like a leader, you know, when I, when I was told, I did, because I didn't vote for Hillary, I was called a misogynist, right? Because I didn't vote for Hillary. Doesn't make Clinton. sense. I vote for a female doctor who's pro-peace, the, one of the actual authors of the Green New Deal, but now it's mainstream, it's, it's a part of our vernacular Green New Deal, which is great, but it wasn't when Jill Stein came up with it. And the thing about, I, I too like, about, I, I like Tulsi too, but oh, that makes me now, an, I'm an Assad apologist. I like Jill Stein, I'm a Russian asset, and now uh, Tulsi, I'm a, I'm a <laughs> Assad apologist. Here's the thing I, I, I like about Tulsi. If there's policies or stances of hers you don't agree with, that's fine, and there's some I don't agree with her on. Uh, I think Bernie's Medicare for All is better. I like the fact that her, she's- I agree with you on that. Yeah. And, but Tulsi's right. Tulsi's authentic. She says stuff that she believes in, even if I don't agree with it, I believe she's being authentic and she's being real because she's actually served her country. She doesn't go, I was a proud Goldwater girl. No, she was a, she's a major in the army. Like, and that was the other thing. When Hillary called Tulsi a Russian asset, I'm like, so, are you saying 
former Secretary of State, that an active sitting Congresswoman and major in the army is working with Russia. Is that what you're saying? And do you have evidence to support this? <laughs> Someone who used to get daily security briefings. Do you, uh, otherwise, what are you talking about? But Tulsi brings up a great point. This is high school, who likes who? And it goes back to a thing you and I have talked about. This is also part of another distraction. Guess what? We're not talking about this ramping up with the war in Iran. We're not talking about um, the fact that Americans are starving and dying and there's people living in tents. We're not talking about those things. We're talking about re this never-ending 2016. Re they always say, we well, don't relitigate 2016. Whenever you bring up the Podesta emails and the DNC cheating, the neoliberals say, stop relitigating 2016, but then they just keep bringing this nonsense up. Yeah, I, yeah, I agree with you on that. Um, of course, it's just another uh, distraction. I think I called it distraction politics because it's taking away from other issues and then also provides those in power an opportunity to do some things um, behind the scenes that we're not aware of because the media is so hung up on covering this uh, issue. And if you look at the sort of type of um, political issues that take over and sort of distract us, they're all gossipy in nature. It's a he said, she said sort of thing. We really don't know what happened. Ultimately, we really don't know what was said um, between uh, Warren and Sanders. I am just going on the side of the individual who has a track record of being honest. Um, so it's, it's really, really important that we don't fall into this trap. Sure, we have to talk about it and we want to discuss um, the, the current issues, but we can't um, let them win and forget about things like no war with Iran or um, any other just really important uh, topic that needs to be addressed and needs persistence. Because that's how we get change is the persistence. And I think it's important for us to look at other countries too and how they've been protesting and how they don't let things go. No. And we can learn a lot. And um, I, I really think we should try to follow uh, the lead when we see yeah. uh, people rise up like that. Yeah, we should talk about the fact that, you know, the Democrats in Congress just voted to increase Trump's war budget. His budget is now $132 billion more than Obama's. Obama's was $600 billion a year, and that was an offensive amount. And now we're at $732 billion. So yeah, we're not talking about 22 vets a day committing suicide from PTSD. We're not talking about 30,000 people dying a year because they don't have health insurance. We're not talking about you know, at the last debate, we talked about Iran for the first 45 minutes, which I'm glad we were talking about it, but not once during that 45 minute discussion about Iran, did we, did anybody say, how are we gonna pay for it? None of the moderators, none of the court, nobody says how we're gonna pay for it. The minute Medicare for All is brought up, they're, they oh, start- Oh, geez, right? They just, every question was framed in a way to make it appear as if Bernie was hiding something, number one, and that his plan was unsustainable financially. Yeah. And then they cut to an ad from a big pharmaceutical company. I know. I Yeah. Literally. And I even told you that. I'm like, literally, there is a commercial for like yeah. Zimbabwe or, or some some pharmaceutical. And I was like, can you believe this? I tweeted that out live as it happened. I was like, it's so ridiculous. Well, <laughs> Taylor, I appreciate you taking the time with us uh, to talk about where can people find you online and watch. I know you Action for Assange has a weekly vigil that you do, an online vigil. Yeah, we do. So again, my name is Taylor Hudak. I've been on um, the show a few times before. You can follow me on Twitter at underscore Taylor Hudak. I'm also the co-founder of Action for Assange. You can follow us at action underscore the number four Assange and also go to action assange.com we have vigils every wednesday evening at 10 p.m eastern standard time um it is me and three other co-hosts so do check that out it's on action for assange youtube channel and also to um uh, somebody i really look up to as a journalist is Susie dawson um, graham is a good friend of hers and she really needs our help guys she really really needs our help um so please do um consider going to protectsusie.com and sign the open letter. The open letter is addressed to NGOs and other organizations who can really help her and her young family. They deserve protection. Um, 
Susie is a fantastic journalist. She has worked uh, alongside Julian Assange and Kim.com. Um, we can learn so much from her work and we need her voice out there and she needs to be protected. So do sign that open letter. Again, that's at protectsusie.com. Uh, yeah, that's great. We've had Susie on the show before. I met her uh, when I was out in Russia in September. Um, there's a couple interviews with her that are going to be in my documentary about going over there. So yeah, Susie is, is, is trying to keep, uh, you know, get a, a asylum and all that. So as Taylor said, go to protectsusie.com. I'll put that link in the show notes and check out Action for Assange. Taylor, thank you so much for taking time out tonight to talk with us. Yeah, thank you so much. Thanks everybody for watching. Please join Ron Placone and I on the road for the Progressive Comedy Tour. Uh, January 25th, we kick it off in Santa Clarita, California. Please come out for that. Chen Kunger is going to be at that show. And then we go to Arizona in February, Florida in March, um, Seattle and Portland in April. In May, we go to Indianapolis, Detroit, and Cleveland. Uh, and we're adding new tour dates all the time. Go to GrahamElwood.com for all your tour dates. Thanks for watching, everybody. You're making Gotham great again.